I'm your host, Zomel Gray, and in this new series, we're celebrating Black History Month and learning about African-American mentors that are making a difference in the Black community. We have a special live audience with us, students from MP, who will be part of this conversation and will learn more about these different individuals. On today's episode, we're excited to have George Chip Greenidge. What is up, everybody? What's going on? So glad to be here. Yes. All right. Beautiful day. Beautiful day. Beautiful day. Guys, let's welcome our third guest of the Black History Month Speaker Series, George Greenwich. Yeah. Let's do so, it. Uh, welcome to the show. Thank you for, for joining us today. We are very excited to get to know uh, about, no, get to know you better and learn a little more about your journey as a mentor and an advocate. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Like, can you tell us about your organization and its mission? Yeah, um, my name is, uh, of course, George Chip Greenwich. Glad to be here. And um, I started a group uh, organization called Greatest Minds. And mm -hmm. Greatest Minds is about bringing the next generation of civic leaders in the Boston area. So our main job is to make sure that young people like you and people in Madison Park and also in the greater Boston area have big role models to look up to. Because many times in life right now, especially after COVID, a lot of people have been inside the house. Right. So one thing that we do is all our programs are in um, Nubian Square and also in Grove Hall, mm -hmm. where we actually have you meet up with young professionals and young alumni and college students in person mm -hmm. to actually hear about their own careers, about thinking about going to college, thinking about going to you know, their career, but also about how they're involved in the community. You know, a lot of stuff you can do online, but mm -hmm. we felt it's very important for you to see live action role models. Right. And so that's what our work does. Mm. What was the, the driving force behind creating Greatest Minds? I think um, living in the city of Boston, one thing, and, and I think all you guys got to really think about this, is that we're a place called Town and Gown is that we have colleges and universities that are all over the place. Right. Um, I grew up in Cambridge, Massachusetts, so MIT and Harvard were right down the street from me. Right. So I had great mentors out of those schools. I was able to participate in the summer programs at Northeastern and Boston University. And so in having that opportunity of having those in the resource, if you go to other places like Texas or Alabama, they're not right around the corner from you. You can't take a bus ride to do that. Right, right. So being able to be here and be involved with those universities really kicked my, um, my passion about making sure other people have great opportunities. Um, I did a program at Northeastern when I was in high school in Mass Pep, mm. um, a pre-engineering program where I met students from Boston and also Cambridge where we all sat around and learned about math and science in the summertime. It was amazing. Mm. And when I went back the next year, I was speeding through my physics class. I was speeding through my chemistry class. Right. But the best thing about it is that I looked to learn that my students in my class were my allies. So I asked them for help. Mm. Um, I think today in society is that if you go home and do homework, you're kind of sit by yourself and do the homework and all that. Right. And so what I've been trying to do in a lot of our work in Greatest Minds, that's why we say minds, is for people to rely on people to say, hey friend, can you check out my homework and see if I did this right? Hey, can I get some feedback on this? And so we're trying to build a collective community like Greatest Minds is to share that excellence is everybody's responsibility. So why don't you ask for help and be right. a resource? Okay. So you talked about, you know, the Greatest Minds, a collective of people. How do you recruit and choose students? Like, how do you go about <laughs> recruiting students? It's interesting. Um, it's really word of mouth, and you know we don't kind of have a um, you know we if you show up and say you want to be a part of this, we kind of let you in the door. It's not okay. like you need to have an A average, you need to be in all this. Okay. We want people that are going to challenge themselves, and so we want people that be able to take take the take the plunge. And you know everybody is the greatest minds. You know there are many different things that people offer, and there's a book by uh, a guy by the name of. There's a book by the name of uh, The Difference, um, a guy by the name of Scott Page. Mm. And um, he shares about um, the SAT. And I know all you guys are telling me you're taking the SAT, ACT. But he shares this whole thing about how people look at knowledge. And it's interesting. If you give three people a test, just say you gave Jane a test, John a test, and Jim a test, right? right. And there are 10 questions on the test. And that Jim and Jane... Um, got six out of the uh, six out of the ten right, and John got four out of the ten right. Um, usually, 
you will look at, you know, who got the two highest scores, all right? right? But however, if you look at the questions that Jim and John got wrong and Jane got right, if you look at it very carefully, and if you can see that the, thing, the questions that they got right and wrong, if you can match them up by that, mm. you'll have a whole different way of a team instead of people getting stuck at the same place. Right. So if the six senses and all that, you need to think about it more collectively. So that's what we got to do is start looking at things more collectively of how we all can be a part of our making a society better. Okay. So do you uh, partner with other sponsors or organizations? Oh, yeah. We've been very fortunate. Um, Liberty Mutual has um, mm. jumped on Boston Children's Hospital. Um, um, very different groups have, have been very supportive. Open Horizon Institute. But also, we've been a partner with the city of Boston um, as well, um, helping provide resources, especially for summer jobs and also academic year jobs. Um, so if anyone's still looking for a job right now, we might have two or three slots available. But um, it's very important that um, we kick down those doors and be able to have um, resources. Um, it's interesting. Um, back in the day, I want to give you guys this. Um, when I was in high school, way back in the day, Minimum wage was $3.35 an hour. You guys hear me? $3.35 an hour. And so right now it's at $15 an hour or some people $18 an hour. Right. So it's very interesting how, how money is different being used right now. Yeah. But also another thing is that back in the day is that there were opportunities available to me. This school, Madison Park, has a ton of opportunities available to students. I know that they're working right now at Roxbury Community College mm -hmm. to start doing some class transfers and class grades and all these other things yeah. where you can get community college credit, is that you got to take advantage of those things. And if you don't, you know, you're falling back on the wayside because you got to realize affirmative action is no more, all right? So that little safeguard that we have to be able to go into these different institutions and to have a level up it's not happening right now. So we need to step up. We need to grant our resources. We got to team up with your teachers, your parents, and your community members, and your neighbors in order for us to have a sustainable um, 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 impact to make sure that you have the resources that I didn't have. Mm. Okay. So uh, looking up your organization earlier, I heard that you guys, like, do you guys provide, like, college tours, scholarships, and, like... Does a young person like have to be a member of the program to be a part of those tours? Um, no, they don't. Um, we open it up to the general public, and we also post information. Um, we have several students at the historically black colleges and universities, Morehouse, Clark, Spelman, <coughs> excuse me, Tuskegee, Tuskegee University. And yesterday, a scholarship came across my desk. Mm. It said $10,000 for a student that is enrolled at um, one of these institutions. And by the way, if they can do a video of themselves, a two-minute video explaining why they deserve the scholarship, mm. they're able to get $10,000. And there are 98 of them available. Wow. And so right now, a lot of different places are actually meeting where you are. Instead of filling out these applications, long thing, they're saying, okay, use your phone and tell me why you deserve the scholarship. Okay. Can you um, highlight some of the most impactful moments or individuals you've encountered? Wow. Um, it's been a real great ride to be in the Boston area because you're able to meet lots of different people from different places. This is a very multicultural city. Yeah. Um, if you go to Atlanta, usually the black kids stay with the black kids and the white kids stay with the white kids and they actually don't meet until maybe college or something like that. Right. So it's a very different way how this city operates. Um, is that I think the most impactful people have been, um, for me, um, I was able to uh, know and work with uh, Charles Ogletree, who was a Harvard lawyer, um, mm -hmm. who really pushed the energy with, with many years of other people about um, bringing communities together, but also the pushing the emphasis on reparations. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm very proud to have him as my mentor for many years. Um, but also we have our living mentors as well. In the city of Boston, we've had some great people um, that have been in positions of power. Um, we have the great Robert Lewis, who used to work for the city of Boston, who's been a mentor and, and friend to many people in the community. We have Juanita Wade, 
um, who used to be um, Chief of Human Services. And also we have um, people like Charlotte Gola Ritchie and also my good friend Ken Reeves, who's the mayor of the city right. of, 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 of Cambridge. These people told me and showed me at a younger age, you know, when I was your age, mm. that you can be in positions of power. And so seeing them in action said, if you can do it, I can do it. And so that's what we want people more to do is get more people to see people in power and positions and saying that, you know what, sometimes we get really scared of government and you know you're looking at the national level, what's going on with Biden and Trump, and you're saying, should I be able to participate? You can participate. And so you have to think about ways that you can see yourself in there and be active in the side of these uh, different systems. Okay. So with all those, you know, those ups, there is bound to be some downs, right? So what are the most pressing challenges and obstacles like that you've encountered? I think, um, you know, the pandemic was really hard for me. I'm a person that is a very social butterfly, butterfly yeah. and kind of extrovert. Mm. And so I think that has really challenged me just about what does time mean for spending with yourself and right. knowing about yourself. I think I learned a lot about myself during the pandemic about um, how I am charged, how I listen to people, and how I need to interact with people and so forth. But you know, you gotta decide what your personality is. Are you an extrovert or an introvert? How about right. yourself? Um, definitely an introvert. Introvert? I say that, yeah. All right, there's also such a such thing called an ambivert, and that's someone that's between. right between. I might actually be in between, I'm not gonna lie. Yeah. I saw you uh, pushing with some people's buttons out here, oh, yeah. some of your friends earlier. So that just shows that you're able to do it. Mm. But what an extrovert is, someone that gets really charged being around person, people. An introvert is someone that stays inside of themselves and really thinks in their head a lot. But, um, you know, and it really takes them a lot to be out in the social kind of pieces. Right. So we're trying to learn how do those, all those different pieces about who you are translates into learning. And that's one thing I've been trying to push young people about is that if you're a young person that's always been punished for taking risks mm. to raise your hand, or if you're a black student or a black male student especially, if you're a little bit louder in class or raise your hand, you know, they kind of get detention and all these other things. Whereas in other systems, when a white male student does the same thing, they get kind of praised to say, good job, he's taking leadership, he's out there um, going for the gold. Mm. And so we need to look at these kind of trends uh, how we are um, communicating to our young people what actually taking risks are. So if you don't take that many risks, so when these opportunities come, you kind of just sit back and say, ugh, you know, I tried that. I'm going to let it down and so forth. Right. Okay. So we've talked about your program a little bit. So we're going to talk a little bit more about you personally. Oh, geez. What do you want to know? Uh, <laughs> can you tell us about your journey in pursuing a master's degree at... Uh, Harvard University, and also how you're completing your doctorate at GSU. Right, right. Well, it starts with Morehouse College, and that's where I got my BA. Morehouse College is also on Yep, it, yeah. it starts with my BA, and that leaving, um, I graduated high school at 17 years old. Mm. So um, I went to Atlanta at 17, and Atlanta was a budget, you know, a new kind of community where all the music scene was coming down there mm. as well. So I got to learn and watch and be around some of the best people. I know Jermaine Dupree, I know TLC, I know the old school, I met Usher several times. I um, also uh, know sure. Killer Mike and all of them as well. But um, it's just very great to be able to see those people in action around the communities, sharing, being a part of it, and so forth. Um, in contrast to Boston, um, it's a very different scene is that Boston's very education and medical and job focused. Right. But Atlanta, there's a lot more cultural things that you can get involved with. So yeah. I think that was one of the best things for me. It was like being around lots of different people um, with many different kind of areas and socioeconomic backgrounds really kind of pushed me to learn about who I was, especially as a, as a black man in society. Which is why you like pursue more like uh, personal type of um, degrees like psychology and sociology, right? Right, psychology, sociology, and political science. Mm -hmm. And that's where I am now. Right. A lot of my work at, um, I'm now a fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School at the Ash Center for um, um, Democratic Governance and Innovation. And so all those experiences come into play when you're thinking about how people vote or how people want to get organized or how people want to just be together. 
you have to think about those apps options and how that actually moves forward to inspire people. Right. So who you you talked about, you know, studying in college. Um oh I actually I don't think you talked about this yet. Um, who inspires you to focus your research on the economic development of urban cities, affordable housing, and the impact of displacement and gentrification? Oh, my Lord. I think um, being in Cambridge, watching Kendall Square, um, which is um, a stop on the T. Right. Yeah. Um, back in the 80s and 90s, and I know Miss, Miss uh, Lewis can attest to that as well, one of the teachers here. Is that, look at that face. <laughs> but that was a total, that was nothing over there. It was just a big open lot. Right. Um, and so, what the MIT professors wanted to do, and some of the Harvard professors, is that instead of going all the way out to Framingham to do their experiments, they wanted all that stuff to happen around them. Mm -hmm. So, this whole kind of concept of live, work, play was a new kind of concept where they wanted to kind of still places where people can live, work, and play in the same area. Right. And so that's when that area started to build up and so forth. Right now, a Bain study um, said that that area is the most creative square mile in the universe. Let me say that again. That area in Kendall Square is the, creative, uh, the, creative, the most creative square mile in the universe. Take that for a second. Science, technology, all those things are happening over there. Look at that face. So why aren't you in Madison Park and all these universities right here and these students having access to the most creative square mile in the universe? That's like Wakanda's over there. Go ahead. What do you think? Wakanda's around a four block, you know what I mean? It's a, it's a mile and a half away from here. And we're not having the opportunities to be able to participate in that. So I don't want to wrap my head around that no more. Um, we're going to go to the next question. Can you share some insight from your experience as the president of Black Empowerment Zone and as the founder of the National Black College Alliance? Yeah. Um, the Boston Empowerment Zone was an initiative out of Bill Clinton, President Bill Clinton. I bet you guys don't even know who he is. But Bill Clinton was uh, president of the United States. And it pretty much goes into the work that I'm doing in my research is that it gave uh, opportunities for Roxbury and Dorchester and South Boston to get some economic development initiatives. So one thing which actually happened there is that that hotel that is actually on Mass Ave over there, um, that is, um, um, uh, I forgot the name of it, but right there, that was actually built from the resources and networks from that. There were, uh, <coughs> there were a number of job opportunities that were given for people. So those, those are the kind of skills what the Empowerment Zone was supposed to do, was to give out, um, I think it was over uh, $25 million, $30 million, but also a bunch of tax credits right. for Roxbury, Dorchester, South Boston, and South End to get some more economic mobility to come happen out of them. But also um, the College Alliance, the Black College Alliance, um, was something I started when I was 18 years old, is that... I came back and I wanted to make sure that other students from Boston and Cambridge have access. So what we did as 18 years old is that we organized and we went to all the high schools. We went to Madison Park, we went to Boston Tech, we went to Jeremiah Burke, we went to Dorchester High. During our spring break, mm -hmm. we volunteered as 18, there was 30 of us that volunteered and got other students involved in thinking about going to these universities. What happened was we had a huge influx um, around that time of students from Boston, and we really take credit for that and so forth. And this was during the time, I bet this is way back for you, is that when the crack, um, crack cocaine epidemic. Um, what, do you, what do you mean way back for me? What you mean? Go that for was, it. That was in the 80s. All right, how old are you, young man? I'm 18. You're 18, so what year was that? So All right. I was, I, was, I was born in 2005. Okay. Go ahead, push back. That, you know about that's, the 80s? That, that's like a 20 year difference right there. Yeah. What do you know about the 80s, young man? I wasn't there. Okay, but what'd you read about the 80s? I love this. Push it back. Um, I know that uh, crack was put into the, 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 the poor neighborhoods, the minority neighborhoods for. Um, um, I don't want to say what I'm about to say because this is, this is um, televised. But it was, 
it was kind of like to fend off the minorities in those poor um, locations because crack was made to seem like the, um, it's kind of like the poor man's cocaine. That's right. And that's basically all I know. And um, I'm not from the 80s. But it's all right. But you know, you have a book and we have Wikipedia and we have all those other things to look at and lots of interviews online. But um, you're right. It was, um, I don't think people realized how addictive it was because it was just like a new kind of thing that was just people would use and so right. forth. But um, it was a very addictive drug and it really took over um, the uh, black communities, Roxbury, Dorchester, Mattapan. And um, I remember coming back and I didn't realize why all these people were walking in the streets late at night. I couldn't believe it, but you know, but this is what the, um, the pandemic did. And then, right. but the weird thing is that under Ronald Reagan, who was the president before Bill Clinton, right. a lot of this stuff um, was under him. Right. And um, there was the war on drugs and all those things that locked up. I bet all your uncles and your great uncles and your, uh, some of our, you know, our uncles and cousins and all that other stuff. Whereas um, if you had this much cocaine, you would get probation. But if you had this much of crack, you would get five years. This much. If you had this much of cocaine, you got probation. This much of crack, which is from, from that, mm. you'll get five years Man. of jail going into it. So the whole system about mass incarceration and all that's all from that. And that's why we're in a lot of things that we are in today. Mm. So what role do you see nonprofits playing in addressing economic disparities and fostering community development in urban areas? That's a great question. Um, we're lucky in Boston because we have a lot of nonprofits here. Um, in other parts of the country, there are not that many. Usually the, the church and United Way and Salvation Army and those kind of bigger institutions jump right in. Mm. But in Boston, we have a lot of different community groups, civic groups, and so forth. So um, I suggest that people join up with several of these organizations because as young people, they, we need to hear your voice, but it's also important that a lot of these places have scholarships, have resources, have networks, which can help you fly and get where you need to go. Okay. How do you think your work as a, <clears throat> I don't know how to say that word, convener? Yep. Has contributed to addressing social and economic issues in urban communities, and what challenges have you encountered in this role? <clears throat> That's a great question. Um, being a convener, and I got to give it to when I was a, 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 I worked at the Boston Foundation as a program officer. So I was in charge of helping giving out um, grants to community groups, um, up to $20 million to community groups when I was 26, 7, 8. Mm. And so I had a great boss by the name of um, Anna Faith Jones, who um, her father was the president of uh, Howard University. He was the first black president and so forth. But um, she was the president of the, uh, a black woman was the president of the Boston Foundation. And so she let me be able to um, explore my leadership. So when all the different donors would come and talk, I would do talks on youth work and all that other stuff. Mm. So I started feeling comfortable doing that kind of work. And so when I decided to go out there and do a community convening with community members, friends and family and all those at Roxbury Community College and also at um, the Freedom House and in all different places like Hibernian Hall, mm. I got the test run to actually do it. So I felt really comfortable in being that kind of role. So the thing is that you gotta take risks, but um, by being around some great people that let you have the leadership and the stance to actually do so really helped me be able to um, understand the role. Mm. Okay, so as an economic fellow at the Federation Reserve Bank of Atlanta. What are some of the most pressing economic issues facing urban areas today, and how do you propose addressing them? Well, the huge things is about gentrification and that people are not able to live in their own homes right, right now, and the rent keeps on going up, up, and up. Um, several years ago, there was, uh, back in the 90s, there was something in Boston and Cambridge, look at that, look at that face, there's something called rent control. Mm -hmm. And so there was... Uh, pieces where a certain rent couldn't go a certain high and so forth, but it was eliminated um, in 95, 96 um, right. by the government, the Massachusetts government. 
And so I think the strong thing is that we're going to be have to look at government as a place where we need to push things to make things go happen. And so we're going to have to be advocate. We're going to have to vote. We have to go out there and make sure that people can afford to stay in their homes. So it's these policies that are written. And so it's up for us to be the people that are in the positions to write the right policies to make sure people can be able to, to live and so forth. So how do you envision leveraging your interdisciplinary uh, inter background into political science, psychology, and sociology, and African-American studies to address the complex social and economic issues in urban areas? All of those are all related. And it's so like, it's ha like having a Batman utility belt, mm -hmm. is that you got to have all those theirs in order to solve the problem. And so that's why I really think that um, when you're in education, and you're looking at things, you gotta look at it from several different lenses. Mm -hmm. And so those are different lenses that help get at the problem. And so I think it's important to take a sociological look at things, also to use a strong African American's perspective, and also look at the economics um, of, of stuff as well. And also look at the politics, because all those things help shape how, what, the, what the end product is gonna be. Right, okay. So are there any upcoming opportunities, projects, or topics you're currently working on that you'd like to share with the audience? Oh, definitely. Um, I'm on the city's reparations task force. Um, so that's looking at the 400 years of discrimination that has happened in communities, especially in the Boston community, in ways that the city of Boston can help right that. So the whole thing around busing, the whole thing around um, um, how, who got stopped and frisked and searched in the 80s and 90s. Mm. Those are issues that we're looking at and see how the harm was affected and how did that help people from not being where they're going to go. Um, another thing is that, <coughs> if you know, Boston um, black households have a net worth of $8 um, per household. These are numbers. Whereas a white um, family has a net worth of $247,000. I know these numbers. Have you hearing these numbers? I, look at your face. Look what? at the face. Eight dollars, two hundred forty-seven thousand dollars. This was the Federal Reserve Bank came up in Boston, and okay. so we're looking at that, and then we look at well, why don't people go to school? Well, why don't people are able to buy houses because mm. of the systematic racism that has always been in place? But also, um, I think the last thing is saying is that there's a couple things coming up. Roxbury Community College is hitting 50 years old around the corner. Mm. Um, they have a big gala. I was um, honored as to be one of the pioneers of Roxbury Community College, um, helping put it on its path. I'm so honored to be one of those people. Congratulations. Um, that's coming up. Thank you. I know, I know. It's, um, and they recognized me for my work at 18 years old mm. of using that place as a place to do black college tours, fairs. So they recognize that. So I'm really proud about that. But um, also, um, you know, I'm just really proud that um, you know, I'm able to still do this work and um, be able to sit on shoulders of many people. And there's a book, I think um, it's called 4,000 Weeks by Oliver Berkman. So I have a question, what are you gonna do in your 4,000 weeks living on this earth? What? That's a question, they're 4,000 weeks, up to 80 years old, okay? All right, um, what, how are you gonna, what's about time management? What is going to be the way that you use those 4,000 weeks in your life? Make bread. Make bread, okay? So you got to look at that. Is that the health of, of where you want to be? Is, she gonna, like, is there enough time for you to be of yourself? Yeah. You know? So you got to look at that. And there's there's enough book, time. Yeah. So there's a book looking at that. And so... And um, that's coming out? It just came up okay. and so forth. So I'm going to be doing podcasts about um, that, about 4,000 weeks about what people look at, how they look at their lives and so forth. So I'm really proud about that as well. This show is coming to an end. We hope everyone has something they have learned from this first Black History Month speaker series. And for this next episode, we have June Archer, author of Yes, You Can. Thank you for joining us for this episode. I am so glad to be here. Thank you, man. You're a great host, man. Big up to Madison Park High yep. School. We'll see you guys next time. Thank you. Bye.